The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again. As soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined, we are imperfect, and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. I returned last night from a stimulating conference in Mexico City on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. As you know, yesterday the eyes of Protestants around the globe, except maybe in Los Angeles and Houston, <laughs> were fixed on Wittenberg, Germany. The Mexico City conference location was interesting, the ex-palace of the Inquisition. The irony was lost on no one, including my family, who warned me that it might be a trap. <laughs> <laughs> After all, Lutero remains an epithet in Mexico. There, our equivalent of turning the hen house over to the fox is rendered es como entregar la iglesia a Lutero. It's like turning the church over to Luther. Yeah. <laughs> I offered a paper on Protestant intolerance, the Calvin Servetus affair, and the dark side of the Reformation. If you're not familiar with the story, it is the one episode, well, several really, that prevents a full-blown hagiography of John Calvin. Depending on your historical perspective, Anglo-American Protestant or Spanish Catholic, Calvin either reluctantly helped the Reformed Christians of Geneva rid themselves of an arch-heretic from Spain, or craftily outed his brilliant nemesis to the French Inquisition, and then after Servetus' escape and passage through Geneva, 
employed all of his lawyerly skills to propel the cruel execution of, according to Spanish historians, the knight errant of theology, who merely carried Luther's sola scriptura dictum to its logical conclusion by throwing out the Trinitarian baby with the clouded bathwater of tradition. Servetus was burned at the stake, by the way, on October 27th, 1553, another Protestant anniversary to commemorate. <laughs> but perhaps that would require too much introspection among the Orthodox winners. Of course, things have changed since the 16th century. We are no longer, at least in the Christian West, killing each other over religion. We are no longer intolerant of our Christian and religious other. But what are we killing and discriminating over, if not religion? What are the limits of our toleration? I would argue that in the area of race and theology and mission, the US church has a problem of idolatry. Idolatry of nation and idolatry of mammon. Let me take a leaf from the important argument from Samuel Huntington, yes, he of the prescient clash of civilizations. In a 2009 essay in Foreign Affairs, The, His the Hispanic Challenge, the celebrated Harvard political scientist argued that America has a cultural, social, and political core, an Anglo-Saxon Protestant core, a core that has shaped her institutions and politics. Over the course of time, each new immigrant group has had to come to terms with that core, to assimilate towards that core, and shed itself of sharp particularities. This applied to Dutch Reform, German Baptists, and even Irish and Italian Catholic populations, who over time were tucked under the sacred canopy of the American nation. Importantly, the acquisition of English was key to that process. The problem with Hispanics, and Mexicans in particular, is that their sheer post-1965 numbers and the regional concentration has retarded that historical process. Huntington called for a moratorium on Latino immigration. In order, or, or less, the American dream morphed into an Americano nightmare. And here you all thought that only reality show hucksters trafficked in nativism. No. Xenophobia has eloquent spokespersons who publish in flagship journals. I often assign the Huntington essay to my students in my Latino studies courses. You can imagine their reactions. So they go off in search of quantitative data to refute the Huntington argument. I usually save my trump card for last. Photos of my late uncle Eliseo Ramirez's burial in San Diego's Miramar Federal Cemetery. And photos of his many medals from service in World War II in New Guinea and the Philippines where he almost lost his life. I then share the story of his entrance into this country in 1924 as a one year and a half old child in the company of his no longer single mother, Maria who had taken up an offer of marriage relayed by post to her village in central Mexico from a countryman living in Del Mar, California. As my grandfather, Hilario Ramirez, escorted his new bride and stepson over the international bridge from Ciudad Juarez to El Paso, he changed little Eusebio Castaneda's name to Eliseo Ramirez. The adoption was spontaneous and not recorded anywhere. In other words, Tio Eliseo was the original dreamer. And like today's dreamers will certainly do, he delivered on his promise to his adopted nation. And it is that nation that has come to stand in for what religion and the church used to stand for. Can we turn on the house lights? Somebody in charge here, can we turn on the house lights? Thank you. The nation now commands our ultimate loyalties. Let me prove it to you with a short test. How many of you would, or know somebody who would, be willing to die for their faith? How many of you would, or know someone who would, be willing to die for their country? 
How many of you would or know someone who would be willing to kill for their faith? How many of you would or know someone who would be willing to kill for their country? I have a nephew on a nuclear submarine right now. Therein lies the great shift in Western history. It has something to do with secularization. It has something to do with sacred myths of origin that speak of Thanksgiving meals with happy native hosts that were taught in the New England primer that shaped generations of early Americans and the Fox Book of Martyrs, one of the three most important books of the English language, that invoke a manifest destiny to capture and dominate a continent and to fulfill, as Rudyard Kipling put it, the white man's burden through missions closely tied to colonial, imperial, and economic expansion. I borrow the notion of a sacred canopy from sociologist Peter Berger. He argues that since the human baby is the only species born with an inchoate sense of itself, unlike, say, a spider or a snake that immediately inhabits a spider or snake world, the unformed human requires social tutelage to understand his or her role in society as a son, daughter, wife, husband, sibling, uncle, aunt, citizen, subject, etc. The sacred canopy, while a human creation, ultimately seems so real as to require, acquire its own facticity, so we internalize it, ignorant of any other way of being but in society. The problem arises when the individual removes him or herself, or is pushed outside of the sheltering canopy of society or religion. That is where madness lies. That is where we shriek in the jungle clearing. That is where the anomie takes hold. The challenge then lies in reintegrating the individual back into society under the sheltering canopy of coherence. Every so often, that sacred canopy is rent by calamity, by invasion, plague, etc., and must be restitched for coherence to hold. That is where theodicy and teleology come in. The Aztecs who survived the Spanish conquest had to come to terms with the death of their gods. The sacred canopy over now New Spain was restitched with a story about a 1531 apparition of the Virgin Mary as Guadalupe, a dark-skinned Nahuatl speaking maternal advocate to protect them and usher them out of idolatrous darkness. Think of our own calamity of 9-11, when our symbols of economic prowess dissolved and of our military might faltered. The American sacred canopy was rent. How was it restitched? Well, a moving ecumenical and interreligious service complete with the military chorus rendition of the battle hymn of the Republic in the National Cathedral helped. A presidential bullhorn at Ground Zero helped. Front page coverage of the meaningful lives of the 3,000 martyrs helped. And vengeful bombings and punitive invasions surely helped. Yet there was another body count, contemporaneous with and comparable in size to that of 9-11. By now, over 4,000 deaths have occurred along our southern border, principally in the Sonora, Arizona desert. These non-citizens have died as they wandered in the wilderness beyond and between the sheltering canopies of their nation of origin and their hope for nation of destination. But these trespassers, these transgressors, if they are identified, lie beyond the reach of our national myth, of our sacred canopy. To honor the interior lives and social identities represented by these cadavers and the detritus found with them would be to stretch our national canopy of coherence too far. We prefer indifference. And in the case of living non-citizens, we prefer xenophobia and deploy measures to drive them out of the canopy using categories of color, race, and citizenship. Today's heightened xenophobia bespeaks an idolatrous church 
or a church with idolatrous spots and wrinkles, a church that suffers amnesia when it comes to its own experience as a sojourner, a church that fails to call the nation to account for scapegoating the wrong goat. The distancing of amnesia helps to explain why so many can fall back on fundamentalistic, legalistic rhetoric when it comes to the irregular sojourner. What part of illegal don't you understand? Others wrap their spiritual robes tightly around them as they scurry past the victim on their way to religious meetings and duties or to a prayer breakfast with the powerful. It has fallen to the Samaritan Latino church that has long lived in the legal shadows and in gray ethical zones to stop, bind up, and carry the victim to places of healing and refuge. It has been a costly commitment which often disempowers. The Latino church has long traversed the dangerous Jericho Road of national borderlands or the Emmaus Road of disappointment, pick your metaphor. For example, the apostolic Pentecostal story is replete with tragic episodes and periods of scapegoating and repatriation. That's what my book was about. The black church has also trod a stony road. What will it take for the more privileged church to walk the marginal roads? I don't know. A turning away from idols of nation and mammon would be a good start.